I'd like to introduce our panellists, thank them very much for joining us. Our first panellist has already been mentioned by his uh, boss this morning. Uh, Paul Conway is the Chief Economist of the Reserve Bank of New Zealand. Uh, we then got Cameron uh, Bagri, who is the Managing Director and Chief Economist of Bagri Economics. Uh, Christina Leung is um, the Principal Economist at New Zealand Institute of uh, Economic Research, NZIR, many of us know it, uh, it as. And finally, um, another of my colleagues, uh, Professor Frank Scrimger from Economics at Waikato Management School. And with that, we'll pass straight to you, please, Paul. You. Five minutes intro remarks from everyone. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that introduction, and, and Jennifer as well, and Kato. Uh, great conference so far. I've been really enjoying it, even though the, the material we're dealing with is mm -hmm. uh, we have many issues uh, in front of us. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to speak five minutes on monetary policy. We've already heard from the governor, so this session, monetary policy. Uh, the report card, it kind of makes me feel a little bit like I'm back at Southland Boys High School in the 80s, uh, getting my report card. Um, but anyway, it's cool to be here, and I'm really looking forward to hearing what the other panellists uh, have got to say and what you've all got to say uh, about our review an assessment of the formulation and implementation of monetary policy, which is a hefty 120-page document uh, that we put out at the end of last year that reviewed monetary policy over the five years to October uh, last year. Now, of course, a report card, it's all about looking back uh, and assessing how we've gone, assessing performance, so that we are better placed to move forward. And that's exactly what RAFIMP, we call it RAFIMP for short, uh, is all about, and in fact, the, the Fakato on the cover of that document translates into look back and reflect so you can move forward. That's very much what I'm interested in here today. Um, the Reserve Bank, we're required by legislation to review our monetary policy actions every five years. Uh, that's a new uh, review under the new Act, uh, and RAFIMP is the first example of us fulfilling that uh, mandate. Of course, the bank. Uh, has done plenty of business cycle reviews uh, over the years, but RAFIMP is far more comprehensive. Uh, and I do encourage you to have a, have a look at it. It's, it's, uh, it's a document that we're quite uh, proud of and quite pleased with. Um, there are three main sections to the report. So the first one provides context. It covers changes in the monetary policy framework uh, that occurred over the five years. So this is the dual mandate, uh, the establishment of a monetary policy committee, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there's also a bit in there on economic conditions uh, going into the review period, so falling neutral interest rates, so neutral interest rates, interest rates that are not contractionary or expansionary, and they've been declining uh, globally and uh, in New Zealand heading into that review period, uh, and also headline inflation in the bottom half uh, of the target band. Uh, does anyone remember those days? They're starting to feel like a long time ago. Now, the second section of this review, it looks at monetary policy in real time. So a big focus on the data that's actually in front of the Monetary Policy Committee as decisions are being made. Uh, for me, involved in the writing of it, it really brought back memories of the, the health and economic emergency that we were all living through at that time. It was a pretty scary period and a very fast-moving environment for all of us, uh, monetary policy makers included. Uh, over that time, I just want to say, you know, bank staff and many other people across the public sector were working um, super hard, uh, incredibly hard, and some people are still recovering uh, from that period. Now, we draw lessons from this real-time review of monetary policy. I'm just going to tick through some of those. Uh, first, you know, fiscal and monetary actions averted worst-case scenarios. So economic ar Armageddon, which was widely kind of project projected or forecast at the time, at the time was avoided. You know, economic growth, it's been extremely volatile, but it's actually been relatively strong uh, over the pandemic, a little too strong uh, as it happens. Uh, another lesson from that period is that a clear understanding of fiscal policy is critical for getting monetary policy right. So in 2020, new fiscal policy rules were being designed and rolled out at pace, uh, and monetary policy had to be across those. So this is about a high trust environment, uh, across Treasury and the Reserve Bank, which I think we've largely got, uh, and also a good understanding across number one and number two, the terrace, of course, without compromising operational uh, independence and not sort of conflating the roles of monetary and fiscal policy. Uh, another lesson from this part of the report is that additional monetary policy tools, AMP tools, so the LSAP program in particular, 
uh, worked extremely well uh, in correcting financial dysfunction at this time. That was incredibly important then. It would have been an economic, an even bigger economic disaster uh, if our debt markets had seized up, uh, preventing governments and corporates from borrowing. Uh, another lesson from this section of the paper uh, is, as the governor alluded to this or spoke about this morning, is that monetary policy could have been tightened uh, earlier uh, in uh, 2021, in which case we'd be dealing with a bit less inflationary pressures now. Now, the third section of the report, it takes a step back and it looks at the conduct of monetary policy over the five-year period as a whole. Uh, this includes an initial assessment of the broader effects of AMP tools. And I say initial uh, because that story around QE, around quantitative easing, uh, it has a long way to run and it's going to be the subject of a great deal of uh, scholarly attention uh, over coming years and decades. Now again, we uh, draw a number of important lessons uh, from this part of the paper. Um, I'm not going to go through them all, but just for example, uh, AMP tools were successful in providing monetary stimulus. Um, so our best estimates are that LSAPs uh, lowered longer term interest rates to the tune of 50 to 100 uh, basis points. Uh, and also the funding for lending program, the FLIP, uh, also lowered interest rates by 20 basis points or more, uh, but it could have been designed with more flexibility, uh, such as an early termination clause. Um, by lowering uh, interest rates, AMP tools resulted in higher than otherwise economic activity uh, and inflation, so they were uh, stimulatory. Um, but it's hard to quantify the net economic uh, benefits of these tools, whereas the mark-to-market um, costs or the accounting uh, costs of holding uh, government bonds uh, is straightforward to measure, and we publish it uh, monthly in the interest of transparency. Now let me uh, finish just by saying that, that lessons learned um, are only useful to the extent that they lead to future improvements in monetary policy making, looking back so that we can move forward. Um, so we highlight nine areas for improvement uh, in RAFIMP. Uh, I'll summarise these. Um, develop broader insights into the impacts of supply shocks on inflation. So this is get a better understanding of the economic environment that monetary policy is likely to be operating in in future. Um, develop new sources of data for economic monitoring. As uh, Dr. Graham Scott uh, noted yesterday, there's a data revolution going on and we need to be right into that, uh, especially given that our official data uh, can be lagged uh, and a bit patchy. Develop better measures of neutral interest rates. So this is about, you know, it's crucial in understanding the stance uh, of monetary policy. Uh, understand the role of fiscal policy instruments in managing economic shocks. Um, refine our measures of maximum sustainable employment, so MSE. Uh, we did a survey, it's not particularly well understood, um, so we need to improve that and we need to communicate that better. Um, use LSAPs to mitigate financial market dysfunction. They work uh, in that space, um, but be cautious about providing uh, forward guidance in uncertain times. Things can change quickly almost by definition. Uh, and uh, maintain the OCR as a preferred tool for setting monetary policy, um, but maintain op operational readiness uh, across AMP tools. Um, again, as the governor mentioned this morning, we are looking, or we are building a research agenda around these improvements, uh, which will determine what we are working on over the next few years. Uh, and again, as Adrian made clear this morning, uh, we want to partner with uh, the academic community, uh, anyone really, uh, that can help with that both domestically and internationally. So uh, I'm planning on visiting all the universities uh, in our country over the next few months, uh, speaking with staff and students and putting that research agenda in front of them and looking for collaboration opportunities. Uh, we're going to get macro conferences back up and running, uh, sponsored by the Reserve Bank and partners. Uh, we're going to get uh, international uh, economists uh, back visiting New Zealand to give us their insights, uh, and Reserve Bank staff are going to get back to relevant uh, international and domestic conferences to present our work uh, and get feedback. So in short, 
Uh, and just to finish, we are back in business and look forward to engaging with you all as we move forward. Uh, and let's get on with it because, you know, as we've heard over the last day and a bit, we have some massive challenges in front of us, uh, navigating heavy seas uh, indeed. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Cameron? Uh, where do I start? <laughs> there was an article I read a couple of weeks ago in a newspaper. The journalist will remain nameless, but the person thought that inflation, the cost of living, would not be the key election issue of 2023. In the past 48 hours, we've received the Ipsos Issues Monitor, and guess what? Inflation, the cost of living, is the key issue, and it's the key issue by an absolute country mile. 65% uh, of New Zealanders put inflation as a top three issue, the next most important issue is the second equal, uh, housing at 33% and crime law and order at 33%. Mm. Rather frightening, education is number 11 on the list and people are more concerned about the cost of filling up their car with petrol than the standard of our education system. I thought I'd make four or five sort of broad points. Look, number one, if you look at the thrust of what the Reserve Bank's done over the past five years and the conclusions of the review, they broadly got it right. Did we really know where we were going? The answer was hell no. You know, so you had to go and you had to go big. And if there's question marks that I think need to be asked, they're around, one, the funding for lending program. And I just saw ASB expanded their margins by 33 basis points in their last financial results, which is one hell of an expansion. And two, the enthusiasm for negative interest rates from the RBNZ relative to a close peer such as the RBA. But that said, you know, the, the broad thrust and the, the recommendations that came out in the review looked pretty rock solid. Uh, point two, Adrian talked about trade-offs. And we are going to head in the next two years into an awkward period where those trade-offs are going to come to bear. And the Reserve Bank's predicting the dreaded recession. I like to call it a reset because that's a little more optimistic and less pessimistic, but still highlights challenges. At the same time, inflation's still going to be up around 6%. Now, that sort of leads me into point three. As we get into these trade-offs, one of the things that, you know, I look back at the past few years and I'm not sure the Reserve Bank included it sufficiently within their discussions, and it's, it's difficult, yeah, because it's not part of your remit, it's not part of the playbook, et cetera, et cetera, but it's the whole concept of your social licence. Yeah, and doing your job, you've still got to have society on board. And one of the things that worries me globally at the moment is that as the economic costs of containing inflation come to bear, i.e. the negative growth falling house prices and you know, unemployment going to I think you're 5.7, something like that, you know, that, that's an awful lot more people on the job seeker benefit and there's going to be social consequences of that and I think there's going to be pushback. You know, so the, the path of least regret might have been appropriate but there was a risk that that could create challenges on the other side as society, I think, is going to start to point the finger. And I'm trying to think about how that is going to get shaped. The second point, or the second question I've got, is one that central bankers probably don't want to talk about, but do we have the right inflation target? Is 1% to 3% the right number? Yeah, we, we now live in a world of repeating supply shocks. We're seeing big structural changes across the labour market around the globe. I suspect globally there is going to be the temptation as the economic costs of containing inflation increase, people are going to want to perhaps move the goalposts. Uh, the third point, and Adrian brought it up, was that about the importance of credit intermediation. And this is what we call the credit channel of monetary policy, which is a fancy word for getting the banking system right. We're going to, not going to make a prosperous, more affluent New Zealand by selling more expensive houses to each other. And there's some deep-rooted structural questions that need to ask about the process of financial intermediation across New Zealand. And Paul, I see you spoke up the other day about supporting the Commerce Commission. 
regard to driving more competitive pressure. Good on you for, for taking that view. The, the final question I have is this interaction between monetary policy and fiscal policy. Yeah, we know what fiscal policy technically needs to do, the, the Reserve Bank needs mates. Well, the government of the day is facing the reality of 30 years of underinvestment across critical infrastructure in New Zealand. So that's the long game, addressing those infrastructure needs through probably one of the biggest investment booms we're ever going to see versus the near-term challenge of tightening the belt. And monetary policy and fiscal policy are going to go head to head. Uh, point four, final one, just some small suggestions in regard to fine tuning. And some examples of fine tuning, I think it be beggars belief why New Zealand does not have a monthly CPI number. It beggars belief why we actually don't know what the migration figures are in New Zealand because we don't know until people don't come back in 12 months. So at the moment it's pure guesswork. And the final thing is that, you know, and Paul talked about this, we need a better understanding of fiscal policy. You know, fiscal policy is a big game in town for the next 10 years and I don't see an awful lot of economic analysis commentary on fiscal policy, I see an awful lot of commentary on monetary policy. Thank you. Thanks Cameron. Christina? Kia ora, uh, thanks for having me here. So um, when I was asked to talk about the, in five minutes, um, what's been going on over the past five years, it really was like, well, clearly we've been through some pretty unprecedented um, times with the COVID pandemic, obviously, and also more recently, the floods and the Cyclone Gabriel. Now, in terms of thinking about what that all means for monetary policy, um, certainly from the supply side, it's created a lot of changes prior to the pandemic. Um, we've had prices but be, um, I always, in economics, we always talk about it always comes back to supply and demand and previously in normal times what you would have is when there's been um, a sharp increase in prices naturally that's an indication for more resources to be allocated to that area in which case then the increase in supply would lead to um, an easing in inflation from that but with the pandemic and the physical um, constraints preventing those uh, that uh, mobility of resources from happening in that adjustment what that um, boiled down to was very high inflation and then of course added on top of that was that um, unprecedented stimulus which um, stimulated demand which then created that perfect storm for inflation. Now in terms of what it means, clearly in hindsight um, monetary policy uh, was too loose for too long but that's in very uncertain times. Um, that's to be expected that for um, the policy makers we were in times where we, um, a lot of decisions had to make be made quickly, um, and that was what resulted. Um, also, um, looking at our NZIER quarterly survey of business opinion, uh, it really highlights all the headwinds that were facing the economy even prior to the extreme weather events that we've had. Uh, business confidence uh, at record lows, uh, with labour shortages being, being the main concern for uh, many of the businesses. So. Certainly there were a lot of these um, things that were already um, challenging for the New Zealand economy. Now on top of that, for the Reserve Bank, a lot of the challenge is in that lagged transmission of monetary policy, which uh, Governor Orr uh, co uh, commented on earlier this morning. Now. Um, the former US uh, Treasury Secretary, Larry Summers, he uh, uses this analogy, and I think it's a great analogy, and I wish I came up with it, of monetary policy being like a wonky hotel shower. So here you are in the shower trying to crank up the heat and the hot water is yet to come through. So you're just cranking up the heat, wanting that, um, and then finally when it all arrives, you get scolded. Now for economies such as uh, the US and New Zealand, where a large proportion of mortgage debt is on fixed term mortgage rates, uh, this lag transmission of monetary policy is particularly relevant uh, because you're having these um, over a year on from when the Reserve Bank first started increasing the OCR. We're yet to fully feel the impact of that across many of the borrowers. Um, over the coming year, we're going to have half of mortgages uh, due for repricing. So many of these households will be moving from fixed term mortgage rates of 2 to 3% onto something significantly higher of over 6 to 7%. So that will mean a significant increase in mortgage repayments for many of these households and we will likely to see um, an adjustment in spending as a result of um, those mortgage repayments crowding out areas of discretionary spending. Now um, Adrian talked about earlier this morning talked about the 
uh, central bank needing to be reactive uh, to the circumstances. And certainly that's true for a lot of the circumstances that are beyond the uh, central bank's control, the unforeseen circumstances that we've seen with the pandemic, uh, the extreme weather events. Uh, but there is also um, that uh, need to be recognising that um, in terms of uh, the monetary policy and the lag transmission of that, what that should mean uh, in terms of uh, inflation pressures later on and being mindful of the risk of overcorrection on the way up as well as on the way down. Now, to be clear, high inflation is very damaging for the economy and certainly um, from coming here as a... Uh, as an immigrant in the 1990, during that time when inflation was very high, and having um, seen my parents with savings and worrying about the purchasing power of those savings being eroded away uh, over the years, um, certainly I can see the damaging impact that high inflation has on well-being. But um, also being and also being mindful of the fact that there's distributional impacts uh, from loose monetary policy as well. Um, so Adrian earlier this morning talked about that new dimension that well-being dimension and certainly when we've seen over the period when interest rates were very, uh, monetary policy was very loose for a long time, uh, we saw that most of that um, impact was for people uh, really who had that equity to make use of those low borrowing costs. Um, for those that didn't have that equity, um, having the asset prices keep increasing away and um, always um, uh, that uh, struggle to catch up with that rise in int uh, interest, uh, uh, house prices in order to be able to get into the housing market, certainly you can really see the uh, distributional impact that monetary policy can have um, on across the economy. So those would be the key things I would um, take in terms of what we've seen even uh, both prior to the pandemic and then also uh, and more recently as we now uh, adjust to a new normal. Thanks, Christina. Frank? Thank you for the opportunity to share this panel with my streetwise colleagues. Um, it's great to be here. Um, I'll cut to the chase. Score, five out of ten. Um, it's not a score for effort. It's a score for outcomes. And, and it recognises that there's a lot of factors in play which influence the outcomes. Uh, shocks come along, which make it a, a challenging job. I'm not too sure many of us would like to take up the governor's role. Um, and also there's all the challenges imposed by Her Majesty's government on the fiscal side, which make it all the more challenging. Um, it's a pass mark, but it's a bit like the chief's drawing with the hurricanes. Not very satisfying. And it's not even against. It's not even a draw with the Crusaders. Um, but we have this evaluation, and the question is, you know, are we thinking about for the five years, or are we thinking about their performance at particularly important times where uh, decisive decisions were made, or are we thinking about um, uh, the state of the bank now? You know. We've come through, where are we at? Are we ready for the future? Um, and the question is, should it be the Reserve Bank reporting on itself anyway, or should it be other people undertaking a review of the bank? And perhaps the bank might be able to do quite a good job of reviewing the fiscal policies mm. that they had to work with. <laughs> so anyway, I, I, I would like to put on uh, the table, three reasons for my, my passing grade, which gives room for improvement. First of all, t to me, there's been a severe loss of confidence in the bank amongst the academic community in which I live, and amongst the borrowing community in which I live. Uh, you know, I'm, I may have a bad memory, but my memory is my colleagues and peers and business associates had greater confidence in the institution than they do today. Why is that? Well, I think many perceive the bank as being like a learner driver over the last few years, overcorrecting, um, perhaps even destabilizing the economy rather than helping us move to greater balance. Um, 
a reluctance of the bank to uh, publicly acknowledge when it got things wrong. And so, um, in, in choosing uh, very major analogies, to say we avoided Armageddon, well, we didn't avoid a lot of uh, lesser undesirable outcomes. So th that's, that's the first concern is, is the perceptions. There's a rebuilding ch challenge there. The second, I, I say, has there been sufficient preparation for the future? We had uh, the conversation about digital currencies this morning, really helpful. But I think there's been a lot happening around the world. I don't think we're as far forward as we should be in ready for central bank initiatives and for central bank oversight. The future is coming fast. And secondly, I think, I think as part of that uh, future building, I don't think we've got our human capital right, our, our academic capability, and, and I'm, I was really excited to hear uh, Paul's comments about the potential for greater engagement by the ba bank with the, the, the thinking community. And uh, I uh, s suggest to you that over the last five years, the bank's breadth of interests has increased, but its depth of capability has uh, diminished. And, and so we, we haven't got the, the mix optimal there. And thirdly, I want to jump outside of the monetary policy remit for a while and, and t talk about fiduciary oversight and prudential regulation. Um, there's been a lot done in the last uh, few years, but I suggest to you that um, there's been a trend towards complexity, a lot of stuff happening, and um, in that, some of the most important stuff hasn't been occurring. And, and I, I think it hasn't been helped by the whole Basel process. I, I, I think, you know, you, you get auditors and technocrats into certain kind of stuff, they, they get locked into the detail, and they sometimes miss the most important stuff, which is essential for ensuring our financial security. So let's uh, look forward to a higher score next time around. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Frank. And I noticed that Paul looked like he, like he might like to ask for a grade reconsideration from, uh, uh, from the current head of our School of Accounting. But I did notice him nodding his head in appreciation of some of the comments that, that, that were made. Um, I guess, you know, when, while I was listening to these panellists and the insights that they were bringing, it just kept on reminding me that economics, one of our strengths and weaknesses of a discipline, is that we use models, we make assumptions. And that's, we're not just a pure descriptive science but the way that you can look forward is to, is to try to distill what's interesting and what's important about a situation, about a, a problem, and use that as a lens to try to take us forward. But of course, our panelists reminded us of a lot of the problems with this. We've got multiple targets, and they threw in fiscal policy as well as mul multiple monetary uh, policy targets that may be sometimes conflicting. So we've got multiple targets, we've got other things in the economy to, rem uh, to worry about as well, including what the fiscal policy guys are doing. Christina reminded us about those lags, and of course these are the, the bane of many macroeconomists' um, lives, that you know you might change something in macro policy, but you've got 12, 18 months time period before it really kicks in. So I guess the first question I'd like to start with, and if you've got questions from the floor, please do raise your hand so we get the mic to you while, while they're thinking about this one. But the first question I'd like to address the panellists is on this issue of multiple targets in a very dynamic, difficult environment. Um, it's all very well to do ex post assessment, um, and we understand the difficulty of forecasting, and also it reminded me of that old joke that, you know, the economists are there to make the weather forecasters look good. Um, but I'd like you, your insights into these conflicting sometimes policy targets. Have we got too many targets? Um, have we got the right targets? How do we um, manage these multiple targets? Paul, do you want to yeah, start with that one? Um, weather forecasters have much better data than <laughs> economists. Um, what I would give for continuous uh, real-time data on where the economy's at um, it would be incredibly uh, useful. And as I said in my comments, you know, I think we can go 
some way towards that, and that's part of our agenda uh, going forward. In terms of multiple targets, I think, you know, the governor addressed this issue uh, this morning. Um, personally, I am indifferent about whether we have uh, maximum sustainable employment uh, in our remit. It's actually in the legislation, so uh, to get rid of it would involve reopening the, the, the Act. Um, you know, which is a government can obviously do that. Um, and the reason I'm indifferent about it is that, um, you know, often, like more often than not, our inflation, inflation and what's happening in the labour market are correlated. So it's reasonably rare for us to have a conflict there. Of course, you know, with supply shocks, um, it's absolutely possible that we have a conflict there. And I think we need a, a clear sort of guidance on what we prioritise in that uh, situation. And we're actually doing a remit review uh, at the moment. We'll be giving advice to the Minister of Finance uh, in April that uh, does address um, some of these things. And the, the last thing I'll say is, you know, as Adrian said, this stuff is, it's hard um, getting across, um, you know, just even in the monetary policy space. And then you go more broadly across the bank and financial stability uh, and inclusion, the other sort of objectives we've been given. And then you sort of go broader again across the public sector, the regulatory system, what's happening uh, in the fiscal space, um, but I think the challenges that we're facing at the moment uh, require all those policy areas to be uh, lined up. I'm sort of, you know, I'm aware, you know, what Graham, Dr. Graham Scott said yesterday about, you know, sometimes it's just good to give someone a job and go away and, and do that, and, you know, I think that's true, but I think there's, in, in some cases, uh, but I think a lot of the issues we're facing into require a whole of government uh, approach. Cameron, did you want to make any comments on this issue of targets? Um. Well, presumably, you know, if, if we do get that clash, then we are going to get that clash between the employment and the inflation objective. The inflation objective becomes sacrosanct. That's, that's the one that you go after. And I guess the bigger issue to me is, once again, how does that clash play out? Because I think it's coming. Yeah, the reality is that central banks, inflation fighting for the past 30 years has had a whole lot of dynamics in central banks' favour, whether you look at globalisation, demographics, technology, that there's a big list. And if you look at what they're facing nowadays, whether it be a world that is onshoring, their systems that are becoming just in case as opposed to just in time, big shift in labour market rebalancing back towards the employees, versus employers, you know, demographics, people are starting to spend as opposed to save, so that's eating into the savings club. Yeah, you know, that where central banks, or the pain that central banks need to dish out now to get the inflationary thief back in jail, is going to be higher. And that's where I'm looking at, how does this pan out within a social sense? And I don't have answers to that at the moment, but it's one of my big concerns. Thanks, Cameron. My um, concern is, uh, this morning I thought the Governor did a good job of explaining the complexity that they face, mm -hmm. but the very real risk is, is that in thinking about this complexity, we create confusion. And it seems to me where I hear talk about multiple objective functions, I start to get really worried. You know, what is the objective... Uh, function and what are the arguments in that objective function and, and how do we bring these uh, different issues together in an appropriate manner giving the right weight to this issue in a, in a different weight to this other issue in a different place. So, so I think if we can reduce the confusion, we enhance the trust and we bring the best out of our advisors and, uh, and others. Thanks, Christina. Yeah, so all policy, as we discussed earlier this morning, all policy interventions will have trade-offs, so it's a matter of whether we make those, are they implicit or we make them explicit. Um, I agree that in terms of priority, uh, inflation from a credibility perspective uh, should be the priority in terms of making policy. Um, and then it's all, um, it's then more about uh, taking into consideration what are the um, side effects, if you like, from um, focusing on that inflation objective. Did you? Um, yeah, just to uh, respond to, to Frank, like I, I, I take your caution uh, that if we get too sort of absorbed in this in this world of multiple objectives with their own set of trade-offs, you know, the danger is that we end up with, with mush kind of thing. So I think there is an argument for saying we need to be very clear 
on, on certain things, and I take Cam's point as well, you know, that inflation should have uh, primacy when we get into a situation of trade-offs. We've got more coming uh, on that with our remit review. Um, but I also say, you know, the world is incredibly complex, and in a sense, um, this challenge for policymakers just reflects the world that we're operating in, and the world is getting more and more complex. So in a way, we can't get away from it. Um, but I do, you know, fully take the point. We need to understand these, which is, you know, that, that's our call. Like, can we work with academics? Like, you know, we've got a lot of work to figure this stuff out, uh, and you know, we can go further with it together. One Thanks. of the interesting things in the last six to 12 months has been the consistency and the messaging coming out of the US Federal Reserve, which is the most powerful central bank around the globe, so you need to listen. Yeah, th they've been on script and it's been a really consistent message and financial markets didn't want to buy into that script at the end of last year, early this year, pushing the pivot, interest rates are coming back down. Well, markets are now erring back towards the Fed's view of the world, you know, We've got a tough job ahead and rates might need to be higher for longer. So the, the message is starting to get through, but all Fed members have been singing from the same hymn book. It's been great to see. Thanks. Can we get a mic to this table here, please? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I, uh, I was actually quite pleased to hear Frank give the Reserve Bank a score of 5 out of 10 because that's about what I would give them and I thought I was going to be the, the extreme one here. Um, the Reserve Bank has admitted uh, they were a bit slow in moving away from their low easing. I think the biggest problem was how far they went into that low easing and they, they don't seem to take any responsibility for that. Uh, Paul has explained it that they avoided economic Armageddon. Well. You can't prove that either way. It, it's something that is unprovable. Um, Adrian Orr this morning said, you've always got to be conscious of the trade-offs, that your tools are limited, and there are long lags. Well, I think you forgot about all of those during that period. The trade-off was completely forgotten. You focused entirely on growth and employment and forgot about inflation. You, you ignored the trade-offs. You seem to forget that your tools are limited. You thought you could do everything. Uh, and all central banks did that. They lost their modesty and they tried to take on everything. And the lags? I went down to the Reserve Bank in November 2020 and said, you're building up asset price pressure, you increase risk in the financial sector and latent inflationary pressures. They were, they, they, you couldn't see all of them, but they were going to come because of your settings and you forgot about the lags. Did you take any of those things into account in 2020, in early 2021? Because it's not obvious to an outsider that you did. Um, I, I was an outsider at the time uh, as well. Um, I've been in this job for about 10 months um, now, which gives, which gives me a useful separation from actually what was going on in the building uh, at that time. I think it gives me perspective uh, on these challenges. I think, you know, when I get asked this question, and I get asked it a lot, I sort of say, well... Uh, cast your minds back to where we were at uh, at that time. And, you know, Joanna talked about massive uncertainty uh, during that period. Uh, the, the bank also took a least regrets uh, approach in terms of avoiding uh, deflation. It was very focused uh, on doing that. You know, and I think with the benefit of hindsight, or another way of putting that, you know, if, we had, if the bank had perfect foresight, uh, at the time, then, you know, and, and that's exactly what RAFIMP is about. It's about looking back to say, well, what could we have done better so that we're better placed um, to, to, to do it going forward. You know, you know the housing market uh, point is interesting. It sort of came up yesterday as well around migration. Um, you know, you need houses to house migrants, but you need migrants to build houses. Um, you know, I, I think if we're worried about uh, inflation in, like, yes, house prices are affected by interest rates, that's clear on the way up and the way down, we're seeing that currently, um, but if you, if you want to avoid uh, big swings in house prices, uh, fix the housing market, build more houses. Uh, it's not clear to me that monetary policy should, in effect, be constrained by suboptimal policy settings uh, in, in the housing market. So, yeah, I, I would argue that all of those things you listed would have been on the desk, on, around the table in monetary policy committee meetings. Um, but, you know, I, I totally respect the view that you're putting forward. Yeah. 
Thanks for that, Paul. Thanks for linking back to some of those other panels that we've had and also reminding us we tend to think about demand when we're thinking about inflation, but of course it's, it's the mismatch of supply and demand. Yes. And longer term, I guess the hope is if we can expand that supply in the economy, we don't end up with an inflation problem. Of course, Paul, you've got a lot of experience in this area, so hopefully that will start to come through in, in the Reserve Bank. Um, we're, 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 we're focusing on COVID, right? But go back 10, 15 years, we've really had a maximum that's whatever it takes. Yeah, we're just going to flood the system with liquidity. We did it after the GFC. Now, a certain amount was required because we were in the midst of the, the old financial crisis, but the, the playbook for what got unlocked over COVID has been in play for more than a decade. Okay, we've got a very popular question that's come through from Slido. Um, do you think New Zealand could be well served by 20 or 30 year fixed, make, uh, sorry, fixed rate mortgages similar to the US and Nordic lending markets? I'm not sure which of you would care to take first mm -hmm. go at this one. <laughs> so um, given the, uh, the discussion about the lags in monetary policy, it would make it even harder to conduct monetary policy, I would imagine, given any changes to the policy cash rate itself wouldn't really translate through for a long time onto the broader economy. Um, so I would say from an if, um, effectiveness of monetary policy, I would, it would probably make things a lot harder. Thanks. Any other comments? Like, I'll just say that, uh, you know, we talk a lot about mortgages uh, as a channel for monetary policy transmission uh, to the real economy. And, you know, it's true, it's a really important part of that transmission mechanism. But there are, there are, there are other ones as well, you know, we've talked about uh, the influence on asset prices. Uh, and, of course, through the exchange rate and the influence that that has on exports and import, uh, import prices uh, and activity in that, in that part of the economy. So, you know, my sort of view on this, you know, I think, I think for some uh, mortgagees, the, the sort of um, stability of being able to lock in a mortgage uh, for that length of time would be uh, well-being enhancing. I, I take Christina, Christina's point that that would even sort of lengthen those lags for, for part of the transmission system for, for monetary policy. There are other sort of mechanisms or ways in which what we do with the OCR transmits to the real side of the economy. I'm not sure there'd be huge demand for the product. You know, the reality is that most New Zealanders like the attractiveness of a one and a two euro, and banks like to max their assets with their liabilities. You know, so that's where they tend to go most aggressive in regard to pricing. It tends to be the better value for customers. Okay, um, do wave out if you've got questions from the floor and I'll watch out and get the mic to you. There's one at the back, please, if we can get a mic um, through there. Kia ora, my name is Reza. Um, I am a property developer, I am a uh, startup owner in the tech space, uh, and I've had countless uh, nights of uh, without sleeps over the past year uh, because of the you know turbulences in the market. I'm also a lecturer of finance and economics um, at Wintech. And um, so um, I, I see a lot of uh, cognitive biases uh, when it comes to, uh, when I look back at the decision making, you have this situation where uh, there is an influx of money, uh, supply of money, and you also have these disruptions in, um, you know, uh, the supply chain, which affects production. So uh, the Reserve Bank would know that there will be lower production. And although it always takes this passive uh, position that things happen, then the Reserve Bank reacts and there's a lag in the policy, um, all of a sudden, when it came to COVID, it decided that it needs to be proactive uh, and cut the rates significantly at the time. So what did we expect, really, uh, in a situation where you have lower production, uh, huge supply of money, uh, well, of course, you would have inflation, right? And it's not something that um, you can say, hey, 
this is we can look at it in retrospect or on the hindsight in uh, yes it, we could do things differently uh, as an economist you, or you know many economists they, they would know that that would happen right so um, I don't really see that as an acceptable thing uh, coming from the Reserve Bank. Uh, another thing is uh, what is frightening me at the moment is uh, that uh, those cognitive biases, like we convince ourselves that the situation is too complex to handle. So it is okay to make huge mistakes. Um, and we, I, I believe we panicked uh, at the outset we um, sort of, uh, the, the Reserve Bank uh, reduced the interest rates, did the LSAP program. On the other side, the government kept the spending and spending. And um, what um, is, is frightening now is that um, we, we have set a 1% to 3% inflation target, and we're hoping to achieve that by the mid-2024. Uh, mid I don't see that being a realistic target. And I see that uh, it is just that we're convincing ourselves again that that's going to happen. And we know that the government is going to keep spending. Right? They will spend and spend. They, and I think uh, at the moment, the real interest rates are lower than the inflation. It's still fueling the inflation, really. And um, at the end of the day, I, I don't see a clear path forward uh, with, with this mindset that uh, doesn't take it seriously enough and doesn't take action in time. Let's, uh, let's open this up to the panel. We're, we're very time constrained yeah. here, so if you want to make any brief comments in response, thanks for that question. Yeah, there's a, a lot in that. Um, mm. Like, you know, we, of course we'd, we take it seriously. Like, I totally push back uh, on, on that. We're very dedicated, motivated, but I, I don't need to tell you uh, all of that. You know, in, in the COVID thing, you know, like my recollection of what commentators around the place were saying, most of the conversation was about how do we get uh, interest rates uh, negative, sort of reflecting the severity of the situation that we were in at the time. Uh, and yes, with the benefit of hindsight, you know, you, you can uh, make... You can make those points, but um, I think it's you know it's really important to think about what was on the table uh, at the time with fatality rates growing exponentially uh, around the world. It was a very dramatic time. Also, you know the stuff on fiscal policy like that was a, a really big uh, fiscal response. The wage subsidy worked incredibly well. Uh, the fiscal authorities were very good at getting that out the door and into people's bank accounts, uh, you know, pretty much instantaneously, and and and, and it worked. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I don't really know how to address your other comments apart to, to say, you know, we need to, as I said, we need to learn more about how these tools uh, interact uh, with each other. We have got a coffee break coming up, so maybe you can explore some of to, those during the coffee break. Right, to, to be fair to the Reserve Bank, there's been a lot going on, like Ukraine, you know, consistent problems across, you know, China's supply chain with their extended lockdown, that sort of stuff. So th this morphed way beyond <laughs> COVID which made their problems more the challenges more difficult. That said, you know, the omelette was, was over-egged. And, you know, I come back to what I said earlier on about the funding for lending program, I still struggle to get my head around in regard to why a crisis management tool was ever put in place with a banking system that was re very well financed and had no problems accessing cash. <laughs> and the enthusiasm for negative interest rates I don't think was coming from the private sector. Now, that was coming from within the Reserve Bank, and the Reserve Bank kicked that for touch. Sorry, the Reserve Bank of Australia just said, we're not going there. We're almost out of time, but Christina and Frank, if you would like to make any final remarks. So, so I think it, within a crisis or a demanding period, large proportions of the population in the business community want to get behind our leaders, they want stability, they want to know what's going on. But the challenge within that is that sometimes it can create a certain kind of groupthink and we, we don't get the alternative view or the alternative view is not specified very clearly. Um, and, and so I think part of the challenge is to build into our institutional design and our processes how we hear those discordant voices even when they are not quite right 
they, they're usually on to a genuine irritant or a genuine kind of matter. And the challenge is for us to find mechanisms to hear that, but hear it appropriately rather than just become reactionary. Yeah, so Frank talks about the importance of stability. Certainly in our NZIA quarterly survey of business opinion, we see that over the history of the survey, during times of high uncertainty, is when we see our business confidence at very low levels. So that just goes to show how important it is to have some clarity, some sort of plan, so that businesses and households uh, can plan around that. Uh, even if it's knowing that the outlook is going to be grim, it's not so much about um, what's going to happen over the coming years. It's like being able to plan around around the events as much as possible. So that's where having that transparency that was talked about earlier this morning um, is quite important so that um, people know what they're in for and can plan around those accordingly. And I'm sorry, I know that Paul has more he wants to add in here, but I'm sorry, I am going to have to close this um, session. I think we, we are moving to a break next, but you know, this has been a, a great session. It's lots of linkages with other sessions, including, you know, Graham Scott asked us yesterday whether, you know, the Reserve Bank Board is, is the right sort of mix. And there's a question come through here that we didn't have time to ask, but it's an interesting question. Is it possible that that composition of the board with limited expertise in this area is making us prone to swings in, um, in, uh, swings in, in decisions that can be destabilizing? So there's lots and lots of room for discussion. I hope the discussion will be ongoing during the break. I'm going to look to Matt now to advise us what time we need to finish the coffee break. 10.50, please. Uh, we've got uh, great sessions coming up after the break, so please go and enjoy some coffee and be back at 10.50. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry. Thank you very much to our wonderful panellists. Sorry for that. <laughs>